you want to call it. Um, everyone, my name is Allison Summers. Um, it's with an O, not a U. And uh, I'm super excited to be here with you all day. I'm currently serving as a graduate assistant, which uh, Dr. Boss, you didn't probably, probably haven't, you know, we didn't know this, but uh, since we last met, we actually changed office names and like became a superpower basically. So we are leadership and volunteer services. Um, and um, I work there as a graduate assistant and I work primarily with our student government, um, advising them as well as the Leadership Academy, which is where this presentation comes from. Um, and we'll explain a little bit more about the, what the Leadership Academy is and um, how you can benefit and learn from it some more. And then my counterpart, the reflection in my work mirror is Drew and I'll have him introduce himself. Hi everyone, my name is Drew Shelnut. I'm the Assistant Director for Leadership and Volunteer Services. Um, and so I work alongside Allison with uh, Student Government Association as well as these Student Leadership Academy workshops. Um, and basically, as of right now, Allison and I comprise the leadership side of the house. And um, so we've got leadership, but then also volunteer services is in our office as well. So if you're looking for opportunities to get involved, even during social distancing, we still have a lot of opportunities out there as well. So if you're looking for any of those types of things, please come and come and find us and we'll be happy to get you connected. And a fun fact about me is I am a, I'm a rover dog sitter. So you need to watch your animals. So if you see me making faces or throwing toys, that is kind of what I'm doing. Um, you know, so just a heads up. Uh, but we'll get started and then um, I, we can briefly talk about um, our the Student Leadership Academy. So it's shortened to SLA, um, but the Leadership Academy, SLA, um, aims to develop you as a whole person um, to become a more critical thinker, um, thinking through an equitable lens, which is you know increasing in importance. Um, even you know more and more every day um, as uh, we're entering 2021, and as well as we want to engage and empower you, as well as the others around you, to, to create positive change at UTSA, your communities, you know, at home, and, and even globally. Um, so uh, that's a little bit about SLA and what we hope to, to accomplish with you through our workshops. Um, and it's more than just this one. So the party does not stop here, uh, but we have three kind of buckets, I like to call them, for our um, workshops, and they follow the social change model, um, which is focusing on you as an individual. Um, how do you as an individual then, you know, interact with the groups that you're a part of, and then how do you interact as individuals and groups into larger society? Um, and if you do all of those workshops, which is 10 total, and then some action steps along with it, you get a really cool graduation medal. And um, you know, you can flex and wear it, which is really nice, so super exciting. Um, and then this is just a quick, uh, oh, I think I'm getting into it too. I'm about to hand it off to Drew, but uh, as Dr. Boss mentioned, uh, these workshops are designed to be really interactive and learning from you. Um, you know, Drew and I could go on till the day is long about what we know about leadership, but we want to hear from your experiences. And, and I really believe that, you know, while you're here to learn from us, we're here to learn from you as well. Um, but with that, I'll pass it on to Drew. So this workshop in particular is kind of split into uh, three sub workshops. So we're, we're going to explore three different models of leadership theory. Uh, so we'll go over the servant leadership theory, situational leadership, and also transformational leadership. We'll cover each of those topics and then we'll talk about kind of when is the best place, when and where are the best places to apply each of those leadership philosophies. So we're going to start off with servant leadership. Um, and so for this part of the session, we're going to define what is servant leadership, we're going to explain the characteristics of servant leaders, and then we're going to navigate the advantages of being a servant leader. So to start off with, you know, what is a certain servant leader? And I like to start off with these two quotes. Um, Cheryl Polo Williamson, uh, who is a success coach, says, a leader with a servant's heart is a truly invaluable asset, and everyone in a leadership position should seek to adopt this type of mentality. And then Robert K. Greenleaf, who, if you get into servant leadership theory, um, he is one that you will come across many, many times. He founded the servant leadership movement um, and also an institute for servant leadership. So a lot of the theory um, that you see coming out is usually coming as a result, if not directly from the servant leadership institute, is coming as a result of investments by the servant leadership institute. So Robert Greenleaf really um, was one of the catalysts for servant leadership as a movement. And he says the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. 
And then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. And that person is sharply different than one who is leader first. So for Robert Greenleaf, it's really that idea that our, our motivation is important when we're thinking about what type of leadership we want to, want to demonstrate. Um, and so not everyone is necessarily going to be a servant leader and not every situation is necessarily gonna call for a servant leader. So how do we determine uh, when those best, best practices, those best times for servant leadership will be? Absolutely. Um, James Hunt's book is an amazing, amazing book. Um, but the most powerful leadership principle, um, definitely a, a good read if you're looking for that. A little more in-depth exploration of, of servant leadership. So when we look at the characteristics of servant leaders, uh, usually they're a complex blend of servant and leader. So you have aspects of both. Um, and sometimes you, as a servant leader, kind of give up a little bit of that leadership capacity in order to serve more effectively. Sometimes you give up a little bit of that servant capacity to lead more effectively. So you've got to figure out the balance of those things. But really the core is servant leaders encourage others by empowering them to take, take the, st the steps to become leaders themselves. So servant leaders care more about the personal lives of others than they do just about completing the job or the task at hand. So with a focus much more on long-term goals rather than short-term goals. And those, those short-term goals, it's not to say that they're not still important, um, but typically a servant leader will prioritize the longer term over the short term if they have to make a choice between the two. So overall, servant leaders value diverse opinions they are interested in cultivating a culture of trust, um, not just in them and their capacity as leaders, but in the organization as a whole or the group as a whole. They are focused on developing the person and the leader within. They are definitely people who sell instead of tell. Um, so they show what's gonna happen. They encourage people to get involved in the process um, and they show them how they're going to develop as a result of that process. As we mentioned, they think and plan for the long term. And one of the key pieces is with servant leaders, they are leaders who act with humility. So this can manifest a couple of different ways. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're always uh, completely selfless, um, but it does mean that there is a part of them, of, of their leadership capacity that's focused more on the development side or focused on the benefits of the project than it is about their specific leadership capacity. So whichever that ends up being, whether it's the project, whether it's development of the team, um, there is something greater than self typically when servant leaders are involved in a project. So I want you to think about in your experience, um, a, someone that you've interacted with that you would describe as a servant leader, either you know, growing up or during your time in higher education and then what are the characteristics that made that person stand out to you? And feel free to, as Allison mentioned, uh, either answer your questions in the chat box or if you wanna unmute yourself, we'd love that too. I'll pull up these characteristics just if anyone's like me and you need to see. Um, Thank you. I can, as y'all are thinking, I, I automatically know who I think about um, for this uh, is, Sorry, the dog. Um, one of my mentors, soon to be Dr. Rayshan Davis. Um, she was my second year supervisor when I was a resident assistant um, at my undergrad. And uh, she was new to the institution, to the state, and to the community that you know I had already known. Um, and so she was kind of like, you're going to be my right hand. I said, OK, cool. Uh, that means I think you like me. Awesome. Um, and she kind of gave me a lot of collateral assignments on top of my normal duties. Um, and at first I was like, why are you doing this to me? Uh, like what is happening? Uh, but it, it wasn't until after that year that I really saw that she was developing me. Um, and so I think that that was her um, really kind of demonstrating what it means to be a servant leader because she was choosing to develop me um, as a leader and as a person. So thankful for that. Hi, um, my name is Summer. I just kind of want to share a little bit about my experience um, with the servant leader. Um, I'm sorry? Sorry, I was just saying, awesome. 
Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can hear me. Great. Yep. Um, so I'm currently working um, at an internship site at the Robert B. Green Clinic. It's um, it's and in the clinic that I'm I'm at is a women's clinic. So it's women's health and. I am in the counseling department at UTSA. I'm getting my master's. So I'm working on my LPC license. And um, I'm also working as a behavioral health consultant. So it's just like a different aspect of counseling. It's much more shortened and brief. And we work with um, the medical team in the clinic to kind of work on the whole person. So it's a new avenue and um, currently my supervisor is an LPC, but she didn't have any background in behavioral health. So um, a lot of it was similar to what, um, I'm sorry, it was Allison, is that right, who just spoke? Yes, that's Allison. Okay, okay, so Allison was mentioning how her uh, mentor was very much kind of like putting her and, you know, developing her skills and kind of letting her shine and so the same thing kind of went with my supervisor currently her name's Tara Ryan and she's been wonderful she's um new to it so she's really somewhat like focused more on letting me develop more and since she has more experience in the counseling realm she's kind of like guided me through that aspect but really just kind of um relying on my expertise or what I've been doing as a BHC. So it's been interesting because a lot of it, I feel like, you know, we're kind of feeding off of each other and she facilitates this leadership mindset with me in the clinic, which I appreciate. And um, I think it's very, it's very much a collaborative role between the both of us. And that's what I really enjoy because I guess through her development of me, it makes her look good because she's, you know, like my leader. So it's just kind of a win-win situation. Thanks for sharing. I love your name too. It's my last name. Yeah. <laughs> Thank um, you. I saw there was a hand raised. I think it was uh, Anna, Anna, if you want to share, feel free to as well. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, my, uh, I guess say. One of my examples of a servant leader would be when I was in high school and we were given a mentorship program and uh, one of my mentors was uh, working in the DEA and I was interested in going into the FBI or the CIA and I thought that, that or the, DIA, uh, the DEA so I was really happy that I was able to get a mentor from there and originally I was going to get a major in criminal justice and he said, well, that's, that's fine. That's what they're looking for. But we're also looking for biology. We're looking for accounting. We're looking for uh, cybersecurity. And he was an accounting major. And he never really promoted accounting, but he just had, he could tell that he was really uh, tech savvy. He understood how the business world worked. He, understand how, he understood how financial data worked. And as a first generation student who's had seen her family having financial problems living paycheck to paycheck I was like you know what I kind of want to learn about the business world so he I told him that I had applied for UTSA I was going to get my bachelor's in accounting and he was really excited because he's like oh you know I'm in accounting too <laughs> so he was so he really like motivated me to think outside the box about yes yeah, so looking for criminal justice, but that's not all that they're looking for. They're looking for these types of skills, these types of skills. And then through accounting, I learned how money works. I've learned how different jobs require different expectations, but they all come together in the business world. And now I'm inspired to kind of teach others about how to work with their money, how to make their money work for them instead of the other way around. So that way they're not living paycheck to paycheck. So that way they can create their first emergency fund or their first savings fund because the first savings account that I made was when I was 21. Before then, we didn't have any savings accounts whatsoever. So I was the first one to do it. So I'm, I was really excited about that. And I think that that also goes to that idea that it's not just about developing within the context of the project, but a holistic development of the people that you're working with, um, giving them the skills to succeed, not just in the workplace, uh, but outside of the workplace as well. And that's going to be something that is hugely a, a huge impact um, on their professional uh, their professional experience 
Uh, some some answers in the chat um, from Suzanne, uh, considering what motivates uh, Suzanne is not just assuming what motivates, you know, the supervisor is the same. Um, Sophia spent 20 years in the military and came across a lot of good leaders. And, and like the common theme was that they took care of people um, and created opportunities for them. And then uh, I saw another one, Anthony. Uh, Sorry, I can't read it all at the same time. Um, his mentor uh, completely revamped their mindset um, and was, you know, thinking of long-term planning, and it's, you know, really been helpful in in their career. So awesome! Thank y'all for sharing. Um, so amazing! Yeah, I love all these things. So, and I do like to. Whenever we talk about servant leadership, thinking about the military is always a, a really interesting way to think about it because um, a lot of us deal with that. Um, that dichotomy, and I think the military shows it really well, of the obligation to serve in the larger sense. So you have a mission, you have an objective, um, and that's serving a larger population than just the team that you're working with. And so it's about that idea of what is my obligation to my direct team and what is my obligation to the larger mission? And both are servant capacities. So how do you deal with kind of dueling servanthoods? Um, how do you deal with this idea that you have different populations that you're trying to serve and you may not be able to serve both at the same time. Um, and so it's something that I think a lot of us, a lot of us see and a lot of us engage with in our professional context. Um, but I feel like the military gives a really clear way of, of thinking about that. Um, so I always like to highlight that as a, as a way to, to think about it a little bit more effectively. Drew, I'm always impressed with it fancy language, dueling dichotomies. <laughs> um, and we'll, we can, I don't know if you want to land there. Oh, yeah. So uh, just real quick, what do you think are some ways that you can become more of a servant leader? So what are the aspects specifically that you want to work on um, in, in your servant leaderhood? Feel free to share in the chat um, or in your microphone as well. And I know a lot of you already answered that kind of in the previous question by talking about uh, the leaders that you've been involved with. I think a lot of us, that's how we determine how we want to evolve. But definitely listening um, and truly caring, even if you can't solve the other person's problem. And that's going to be something that you're, you're definitely going to come, come into contact with. Um, and I know it's something that I've had to deal, deal with recently um, in a leadership capacity is as we go into social distancing, and there's so many things that are out of our control. And so, you know, Zoom goes down, our wireless is out, all of these things that people have no control over. Um, and so thinking about, okay, what are the things that you do have control over and how do you work with those things to try and help address some of the things that you don't have control over? Um, and so I think that that's one of the pieces where servant leaders really get involved is, okay, let's focus on the things that we can change. Let's focus on the pieces that, that we can develop, even when some of these things are, are beyond our capacity at the moment. I think personally for me, uh, one of the things I, I, I want to try and do in order to become a more servant leader is, is that I, I'm also 20 years in, in active duty, still on active duty. Um, and with this whole pandemic, I learned that you've got to be able to balance, like you've already said, uh, you've got to be able to balance what your obligations are to the organization with with the livelihood of your employees um, and, and even your peers or your bosses. Uh, so to be the honest broker and say, hey, if, if we don't get this work done on medical equipment, then people could die. But I don't need 100 of you here. I need 50 of you here. So the way we're going to work it is this. You know, we're going to look at um, who's, who's, who's in a high category or high risk category um, and, and who's not. So who, who has the flexibility to, to, to stay here and work versus who, who we absolutely need to go home. Not only because well, they might be high risk, but also because their their family members might be high risk. So that's something I want to work on is is being able to quickly recognize in a in a ever changing environment what you have to do at work versus what you have to do for your employees. Definitely, thank you. And the comment in the chat I think is really important as well. Um, focusing more on helping others develop within their role and in the greater context of their lives and future. And I think that that's one that's really important too, is it's not just, okay, what is your role now and how do I help you 
be successful in the role you are now. But I think one thing that really great servant leaders do is they look at what, what is the next role for you and how do, you, how do I as a leader prepare you for that next role? What are the skills that you may not need right now, but that you definitely will need when you move into that next position um, and helping in the development of those. And then also mastering the interpretation of nonverbal communication. Uh, one of our other workshops is about interpersonal communication. And we definitely talk a lot about that in that one. Um, but that idea of how we communicate and in particular, um, modern communications, a lot of how we communicate is that um, voice and tone, body language, these, these external pieces that when we're communicating by email or we're communicating by text, we totally lose. And so people tend to fill in the blanks on those things. And sometimes they fill in the blanks in the ways that we don't mean them to fill the blanks in. And so how do we go about making sure that when we communicate, um, that we're filling in the blanks as best we can um, in the places that our current media methods really drop, drop the ball in some ways. So how do we fill in, fill in for those things? And that's definitely something that I think servant leaders are, are very much focused on. Yeah, I'm guilty. I read tone in a thing and then I'm you know, ready to, to post up on whoever. So uh, kind of switching gears, we're going to, you know, uh, or highways, you know, whatever you want to think about it. Um, I forgot to tell y'all, buckle up. We're on a learning journey, so please buckle up. Um, but we're going to talk about transformative leadership. So um, switching highways, you know, maybe we were just on 410, now we're on 1604, whatever you want to think about it. But uh, we're going to define transformative leadership. Um, we're going to explain and discuss the characteristics of transformative leaders and then talk about like maybe what's advantages and disadvantages of using this particular style of leadership. Um, so first things first, yeah, the, what is a transformative leader? Um, and so some characteristics um, of them is they're often called uh, quiet leaders and this is not necessarily meaning that they are um, meek or not very vocal, but it's more of um, you see that last point, they lead there by example. Um, if you think of the common uh, adage, uh, <clears throat> actions speak louder than words. So they're going to let transformational leaders are going to let their actions speak um, more so than their words at times. Um, they're very empathetic and relationship oriented, so very in tune um, with their team. And some of our servant leaders are willing to make sacrifices um, that are necessary. Um, and that could be that the, a way that they lead by example. Um, doing so like courageously and confidently as well. And um, some of their ideal situations, um, or, you know, if you like picked up a transformation leader and you just want to drop them somewhere, these would be the, the places that you drop them. Um, and that would be um, an outdated organization that needs, you know, a little retooling, you know, a little, um, you think, I think of, uh, I really like HGTV where they like flip houses. So maybe an organization that needs to be like a flip house type of action, um, as well as small com small companies with big dreams. It's got like Friday night lights, flashbacks, like big hearts can't lose. Um, but small companies with big aspirations that need that person to to be that leader that leads them confidently um, and with like the appropriate like actions. Um, and then organizations desiring to change. Um, so that's kind of where you would want to see those, those leaders. Um, and I think real quick, my, my question for you is if you look at these characteristics um, listed, which one is you know maybe most important? Um, or like, if you're gonna be a transformative leader, like you have to be one of these things. For me, I think it would have to be, um, you have to be uh, empathetic, like in, in know people, like you can't, you can't work with people without know, you know, how to interact with people um, and not be in tune with them. Leading by, I see, uh, leading by example, leading by example, for sure, absolutely. There's no right or wrong answer, so don't worry. <laughs> Lead by example, yeah, absolutely. Um, I saw one more come through. Leading, leading by example, all right. Survey says leading by example um, is the, the crowd favorite. Um, yeah, I think that no, no one of these characteristics is more important than the other. It's just you know, it's your personal preference. Um, but keeping these in mind, we're going to talk about um, oh, way too far. Ah, okay, 
Um, sorry, uh, I got a little too uh, clicky there. But so advantages of being a transformational leader um, include they're really great at communicating new ideas, right? So those situations that they're really ideal for are, are organizations that are desiring um, to change, right? So they're going to come in with fresh ideas, um, new ways of doing things, and they're just going to like bring some new life and some new breath into the organization. Um, Similarly, they're kind of good at balancing their short-term and long-term goals, right? So they, they lead with confidence because, you know, okay, if we want to do this, well, we have to do this right now, but we're going to do this right now because we want to see this in the future. Um, and again, they're really great at establishing um, trust and co like says coalitions, but really those relationships that you need within your office or department, as well as like externally as well. Like who do you need to partner with? Um, and again, similarly, they have high emotional intelligence, meaning that uh, they can empathize with others and kind of sense, you know, how, how is what I'm doing or what's happening in the world affecting my team. Uh, and then some disadvantages, I want to say disadvantages are just some, you know, some other things to consider um, is that being a transformation leader is ineffective for the initial stage. So let's say if you're a brand new company, everything you're doing is new, right? Like, so there's nothing to change, <laughs> if that makes it. Um, again, similar, they're requiring an existing structure to fix. So, you know, like, oh, I wanna come in and change everything you've been doing. Well, we've been here for like five minutes. So there's nothing really to change. We haven't done that much. Um, and then bad fit and, and bureaucratic hierarchical structures. Um, they really, transformation leaders kind of need um, just space it to, to do what they need to do. Um, and so my next question for you all is, is similarly, I'll pull up the characteristics um, back up, but looking at these characteristics and thinking about the situations where transformational leaders, you know, work and operate best, um, can you identify in your time, whether at UTSA um, or before, uh, that you've had a transformational leader and what kind of made them that? Um, and you can share um, on the microphone, okay. um, on the microphone or in the uh, chat box. Um, for me, I think, uh, again, my other mentor, um, she's now Dr. Amanda Martin. And um, she was my advisor for my Ag Ambassador group when I was an undergrad. Um, and we, were just, uh, I think it was my first year and we were about like 16 or so ambassadors and we were doing like everything under the sun. We were working with current College of Ag students. We were doing events for alumni. We were driving people to different things for the Res College. Uh, we were interacting with, and we were recruiting students. Like we were doing everything and we were like running ourselves dry. So Dr. Amanda Martin came in and was like, we're going to kind of go back to the bare bones. Um, and said, we're going to fo solely focus on like student recruitment or like high school student recruitment. And um, we kind of went from a team of 16 or 17 to I think seven. So it was a lot of work, but it was really kind of cool because she came in and she updated it and retooled us and gave us the tools to become a really successful, um, amazing group that, you know, if you think about servant leadership as well, she was really developing me as a leader and a person. So. Um, I love her. So I think that that is a really great example of, of a transformational leader. I saw some, some chats come through. I don't know, Drew, if you could see them on the chat box. Yep. So, uh, Sophie said, sometimes transformation doesn't equal change. Uh, it's more so about being able to carry out the vision of a company with the people and resources given. Yeah, I love that. Um, it doesn't always have to be like, okay, I'm going to change everything that you do, right? Especially, you know, if you think about, uh, the one of the other characteristics is that they're people oriented, right? So if you have a team full of Allisons like myself, I don't like change. So if you come in here and you try to change everything, like I'm gonna like probably cry or something, um, <laughs> or just freak out and, and not really want to work with you. So it's navigating those things, and maybe I don't have to change everything, but like let's use what we have and let's use it more efficiently, or let's you know change change the game up a little bit, but like still stay true to our mission, um, but do so in a way that is. Um, more beneficial, and uh, I think of you know working smarter, not harder. Um, and then Anna, I saw that you raised your hand, so feel free to share. 
uh, for uh, another mentor of mine at UTSA, I was in the program Trio Student Support Services, which is a program for first generation students to encourage them to uh, to finish with their bachelor's or and to think of you know graduate school. And what really made uh, John Bonner stand out was that he was very empathetic and he was very relationship oriented. He was assigned probably like 50 students per semester, but he would try to make a, a relationship with each one, memorize our names, how we were doing, what classes we were taking, what our majors were, what we were interested in doing. And he just really was very a very supportive foundation for the students who didn't used to have that uh, support foundation or they, they couldn't find it at UTSA because it's it's a big change from high school to college. It was a big change for me. So it was uh, he was he really stressed the uh, empathetic and relationship oriented trait of a transformative leader. And Allison, you're muted. Yeah, that, that, that face you just saw was the, oh, I'm still muted face. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, Dr. I think Dr. Bonner is doing a bit with this, right? Or am I making the note? I uh, did yesterday, yeah. Oh, darn, okay. I don't know what it is, not sometimes. But, uh, and then uh, I saw in the chat, Sophia, uh, a transformational leader has the ability to change oneself to lead under the current circumstances or new ones. Um, yeah, I think the transformation, uh, you know, occurs externally and a little bit of internally as well. And so I think that's really a great segue to our next leadership um, oh, style, which I'll give to Drew in just a second. But before I do that, um, so sorry. Uh, there, we also, there's another similarly worded word, but and we talked about transformational leaders, uh, but we also talked about transactional leaders um, as well. They're kind of uh, a little bit of a mirror each other. And so um, a transactional leader is someone that they work within a prescribed system. So um, they like to solve challenges according to ways that they've already done it before. Like I know if I need to get product A, I have to do B, C, and D, and that'll get me there. Um, they want to know the step-by-step -step approach um, and then minimize variation in the organization. Um, as well, where on the flip side, transformational leaders, again, they work to actively change the system, finding new ways to solve um, same problems and understand, again, that change occurs, uh, which is a struggle for me. <laughs> um, and they want to make sure that they maximize their team's capability and capacity. And so um, I kind of compare these two right here, not to say that being a transactional leader is bad, but just kind of comparing the two. And so, um, my last question for you is, uh, you know, looking at these two characteristics next to each other, do you think that you are more of a transactional leader or a, a transformational leader? And you can answer um, in the chat or uh, microphone. I think for, again, to use my example, I think for, for myself, uh, I find that I, am a little bit of both, right? So I'm kind of giving away the answer, but uh, I like, I love to work with a prescribed system and do things the way I know them. Like if I know, uh, I saw this uh, TikTok, there's apparently a new fancier way to tie your shoe. I don't wanna learn this new way. I'm gonna tie my shoe the way that I know how to tie my shoe, <laughs> um, right? But at the same time, I understand change will occur and, and kind of has to occur. Um, I don't think I shared this before um, earlier, but I, I come from to UTSA from South Louisiana, um, and it was really not my plan uh, to end up at UTSA, but I did, and I'm very thankful for it. Um, but it was a change that I had to kind of like, okay, I have to get on board. This has to happen, um, as well as I also decided to cut all my hair off at the time, too. So, like, I had to understand that change is going to occur. My plans don't always, you know, come to fruition. So, I see myself, like, tag teaming on both sides. I have kind of a comment where with transactional versus transformational. Yeah. Sometimes I think that you might need to, at least in my experience, you have to start as a transactional leader to kind of work your way into the system and gain trust from people within the system because you're not gonna be allowed to be able to do any transformation until you kind of have some type of settling in the transactional. 
Yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing, Dr. Boss. Like, kind of how you're, uh, I mentioned before, like, we, I keep saying, like, change, right? So, like, you can't just come in and change everything because if it's a team of Allison's, they're all just going to cry and freak out. Um, but, you know, showing that you're kind of a team player, right? Again, using that, like, empathy and, like, relationship orientedness, um, you know, hop in, become part of the team, and then start bringing in those new ideas and things. So, yeah, there's kind of like a, Kind of like how with Zoom, we have waiting rooms, right? So like the transaction leader could be like a waiting room period. Um, that's a really great way to think about it. Thanks for sharing. I'm gonna see a few more chats coming through. Um, <laughs> Jasmine said, I agree with Dr. Boss. <laughs> um, and then Michael, uh, I tend to work within the system, but can be creative on how to get problem solved. And then Suzanne, um, depends on the context. Yeah, I think. Ding, 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 spoiler, um, context is super important. And so, um, you know, with that, I think um, that kind of is a really great way to kind of transition back to Drew. So I will um, pass on to you, Drew, for our next one. Definitely. And just really quickly, one of our other workshops is True Colors, um, which is a personality assessment. And I think that that really highlights in that, that last slide of transactional versus transformational. Um, because we tend to, um, True Colors is a, a four four personality assessment and um, where you are given a, a spectrum. So you have all four colors and it's just about which one is strongest within you and then the relative strength of each of the personality styles. But golds um, in, in True Colors, which tend to be very process oriented, tend to be very transactional leaders. Um, and so they tend to very much want to stick within the process that exists except for if the process is clearly not working, they are the first ones to jump to a transformational leader because the whole point for Golds is the process is designed to get us an end result. And if it's not getting us that end result, then the process isn't working and it needs to be fixed now. So it is that very much contextual piece, um, whereas oranges definitely tend to function in the um, transformational, like. Let's, let's try something new and let's see if it works and let's, um, let's move really quickly. And without that piece of ever going through transactional, uh, like Dr. Ross mentioned, you have to cater to and you have to court your goals. You have to get them involved in the process. And if you're not doing that, then you'll never be able to be an effective trans, trans, uh, transformational leader. So um, we will be talking about true colors and we'll, we'll also in that session, um, be specifically talking about in the social distancing context, some of the ways that our true colors manifest differently during this time. So I definitely encourage you to come uh, to our next session where we'll talk a little bit more about that. But our next uh, type of leadership, the final of the three, uh, the trifecta for today, situational leadership. So uh, we'll start off here looking at the leadership pizza model, which Allison will explain. Uh, it's something that she brought to this process and I think is really, really awesome, a really good way to understand. Um, and then we'll talk about situational leadership and specifically we'll look at the Hersey Blanchard model um, of situational leadership theories. Are doing pizza last or first? Uh, we can go ahead and do it. Uh, do you want to do it at the end? Yeah, it's the homework yeah. piece. So. Let's come back and do it at the end. Okay, spoiler. Ah. <sighs> awesome. So what is situational leadership? What do you think? Just based on those words, what would you think that situational leadership would be? Don't overthink it. Awesome, Anna? Uh, I think it's when a leader arises, you know, like leadership arises, when a situation comes or a challenge comes. Okay, so leadership that manifests in a certain situation. Um, I see leadership specific to a situation, uh, leadership through a particular challenge, um, adjusting your leadership style based on the situation, um, and then using the right type of leadership for the situation. And all of these pieces are correct. Um, it is not only just about a leader emerging for the correct situation. So there are gonna be times where a certain set of skills lends to a specific situation more effectively. So you may have that leader that steps up because of the skill set that they have, but also about adjusting your skill set to uh, the situation that your team, your group, um, 
it's uh, in some cases your society may be in what do they need at that point and then adjusting your skill set to meet that so at its core situational leadership is a theory that posits that different situations and teams require different leadership styles as they grow and develop um, and effective leaders must know when to utilize a new style to better serve their team and so the Easiest way I think to understand this, um, and one of the, the best uh, and most explicit models for looking at situational leadership is the Hersey Blanchard model. Um, and it really works through, um, this is the best picture that I can find of it, but it bothers me because this picture was set up to go from right to left, which just seems weird. So we're gonna start at the bottom right um, with that pink circle with directing. And so at the beginning with your team, um, you're going to have enthusiastic beginners. So these are people with low competence, but a high commitment to the organization. So they're really excited to get to work, but they don't know necessarily what they need to do within the context of the organization. And so at that point, you need a directive leader. You need someone who is going to be very, very directive, um, very descriptive about here's what you're going to do. And they don't necessarily need that emotional encouragement at that point, um, because they know that they're going to be learning. They know that they don't know everything right away. Um, so you can be a little bit more, hey, you need to do this right now. Hey, this is your next step. Um, so that very explicit directive behavior uh, in that piece. As your team member becomes more familiar with the processes of the organization, they tend to become the disillusioned learner, which is that uh, kind of olivey green uh, right above it. Um, and so these are people with some competence. They're starting to learn the skill sets of the organization, um, but they're really getting tired out. Um, I've been learning for a long time. I feel like I should know it by now, but I don't. Um, and so they're getting stressed. Uh, they're tired of the, of the things that they're going through. And so they need both uh, the high supportive and high directive behavior. So as a leader, this is probably gonna be the time where you're, you're feeling most stressed out because they are requiring more from you um, because they need, they still need that skill set development, but they also need the emotional encouragement from you at the same time. So really making sure, and usually in the workplace, this tends to happen at about six months to a year and a half um, is the place where employees tend to hit this, this slump. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you are giving those positive reinforcements, commenting when they're doing things well, um, which isn't really necessarily, you definitely wanna do that with, with your directing, um, but it's not quite as important as it is during the coaching phase. As you move towards that, um, orangey salmon circle, um, you're moving into the capable but cautious performer. And these are people who are, uh, they're getting to high competence, um, but they're having variable commitment. And this is usually the one and a half to three year mark in a work organization. And this is the point at which people are really thinking, okay, I've developed my skill sets and I feel pretty comfortable. There's still definitely some places where I could stick with this organization and learn more, but maybe it's best for me to go to another organization where I have a little bit more opportunity to, to learn new things. Whereas I'm just kind of tailoring my last 10% of skills here, I could be adding a whole new skill set if I went to another job. And so this is where um, you're still wanting that high supportive behavior because this is the place where most employees tend to leave the job is when they're like, okay, I feel pretty good about the work here. Um, I can leave with a positive recommendation from my supervisor which typically if you're leaving in the coaching phase, you're probably leaving because you feel like you're not ever going to get a positive uh, recommendation from your supervisor. Supportive stage is I feel positive about, you know, what's happening with my supervisor, but I feel like there might be some place where I could do better work. So it's the point at which you as a supervisor, there is still some skill to develop and you also have a high performing individual in the position. So these are the people that you want to keep. So you want to be very supportive. This is the point where you need those, those positive reinforcements of you're doing really great work here and uh, making sure that you have the recognition pieces of you know, either awards or just kind of simple things, ways to recognize the positive work that someone's doing. But the supporting leadership definitely does not need as much directive behavior. Um, they, are, they really know for the most part what they need to do and they know when they've made a mistake. They know to come and ask how to fix it if they don't know how to fix it. So they are typically going through that process at that point. And then the last piece, um, kind of your, your ultimate, um, is the self-reliant achiever who is highly competent and highly committed. 
Um, they, they feel good about the work that they're doing. They feel good about their ability to do the work um, and they enjoy the work that they do. And that's the point at which you go to delegating as a leader. So you, you know the tasks that you need to have and you really focus on, okay, what are the strengths of my team and how do I give out tasks based on those strengths? Or what are the areas where my team might still need to develop and then giving out tasks based on that? But for the most part, you're able to just give those tasks and know that if somebody has a problem, they'll come to you to, to try and solve it. But for the most part, they should have the skill sets to solve the problem for themselves. Now, the key piece is um, this is a really great way to think about overall when you're, you're, you're thinking about being a leader and how to lead within a team. The challenge is, as a team leader, you're probably going to have one directing, two coaching, one supporting, and one delegating all at the same time. So you're having to implement simultaneously all of these different styles with different members of your team. So that then becomes the challenge of how do I keep track of, first of all, what everyone needs and when they need it. Um, and particularly for the people, when you get into a place where you have a lot of people who are in that coaching phase, where you're having to be really supportive. Um, as I mentioned before, you're being supportive and directive. So it's a huge drain on you as a leader. So particularly when you get a team that's highly in that coaching phase, really bringing in for any of you who are from large families, you will know this very well, bringing in your older um, siblings, bringing in your more experienced teammates to step into some of those leadership roles is gonna be highly necessary for you, particularly when you have a huge kind of coaching um, piece of your team. So just making sure that you're, you're thinking about that, thinking about your team as a whole, and what are the places where you are capable as a leader of meeting all those needs? And sometimes you just aren't. You don't have the bandwidth to do all of those things. So trying to, to make sure that, first of all, if you have the, the flexibility with your, in your team to make some of those changes and pull in leaders from your delegating um, team set, great. But if you don't, making sure that you're communicating with your supervisor, hey, I have a lot of people that are in this framework. And if you can use, particularly this model is a really great way to explain it. I have a lot of people who are in the coaching phase right now who need this. And if you're able to explain it that way, supervisors a lot of time are like, oh, I understand what you're telling me. I can give you some additional support to help with this. I just think it's funny, Drew. I call it chartreuse and like nectarine. You're like <laughs> olive and salmon. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. I still um, have this idea in my head for some reason that chartreuse is a red color and I know that it's not. But as a kid, whenever I read chartreuse, I just pictured red. And so it still automatically goes to that in my head, even though I know it's a, a, know it's a green. I got you. Another just quick to add on to Drew is you understand this so well. And it is where it goes right to left. I also like to think of this as like riding the bike method. So, you know, if you're in that directing phase, if you've ever taught someone or you have learned to ride a bike from someone, um, this is when the, the adult is uh, holding on to the bike and like running alongside the, the person learning to ride the bike, right? Um, or it's even like their training wheels. So they're like just learning, but they are so excited because they're riding that bike. And then maybe you take those training wheels off. And so you still need to kind of hold on there a little bit to them and run alongside them, but they are still like pretty pumped about riding this bike and like you are giving them what they need encouragement wise. Um, and then, you know, the, the supporting, right? Um, again, they're like, whoo, okay. Um, I don't know if I can do this bike thing, man. Like I fell that one time, like, oh my gosh. But like, okay, I'm gonna still keep riding this bike. And then once they get to that blue, right? They're like, uh, what's the race? Uh, Tour de France, they're Tour de france -ing. Um, because they were just like, they, they got this. Um, and then uh, Dr. Boss asked Drew if this is an image from a book or do you recommend this? Uh, do you recommend a book on this type to support? Uh, Definitely. So people? this image isn't directly from, uh, it's just a, an image for the model, uh, but uh, I'm trying to remember his first name. I want to say it's Ken Blanchard. Uh, is the Blanchard from this model and wrote a whole book on the different ways to um, to implement this this leadership theory. I'm trying to bring it up right now. Also, I, I say it wrong all the time. It, I say Hershey, like the chocolate, not that I mean. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for the sake yeah. of time, Drew, I'll head back to um, one of the, one of the books that I think is really interesting is the One Minute Manager. Um, and it's really easy to utilize. And that's, that's one of uh, Ken Blanchard's books. And that one specifically is looking at um, 
if a, a, a subordinate or if a teammate is coming to you with an issue, kind of the one minute solution that'll help them with that problem. So I find that one really easy to utilize. Um, awesome. I'm gonna try that out too. Um, so our last little, our landing point, if you will, um, this is, I'm very hungry, so this is making me a little hungry. Um, and also your homework um, for this session, if you're looking to get the badge, um, is what we call the leadership pizza. So this is actually something that I did while I was working with um, some, I think it was a 4-H or FFA or uh, some, some ag students while I was working um, at my undergrad. And so basically uh, what this is, is it's the leadership pizza. You can also call it the pie, the cookie cake, whatever round food that you want it to be. I call it the pizza. Um, but each slice here represents um, a different characteristic uh, that a leader could possess. And so what you'll do is I'll put it in the chat in just a moment. I need to like not share my screen and stuff because I'm on one screen right now. Um, but you will get this in like a Word document and you can print it out or, you know, use it on your computer or, you know, maybe if you like bar grass, whatever works for you, but kind of color in and, and, and decorate and create your pizza that you think an ideal leader should have. Um, according to these and, and if you see a characteristic on here that is missing like you can definitely add that as well um i wish i didn't do the one before usually i do a pizza before to show you oh and thank you for sharing that dr boss uh, but for example i am very much a, a person that believes that like passion is, is super important so if i was it could also be a cheesecake oh my gosh so if i was coloring in my leadership cheesecake my leadership pizza i would color in a lot of that passion um and purpose uh, because I think that that is super important and very much can drive you. Um, and I would also, um, I would color in empathy a lot. I would give a lot of sauce in that area, but I wouldn't do, I would, uh, I would probably do about 75% um, because empathy is this idea that um, I can understand where you've been because I've been in that situation. And we can't, we can't know everyone's situation. Um, for example, uh, myself, I am, uh, I identify as female and I am white, and so I will never know what it is like for my um, uh, my colleagues who are women of color to to understand their experience, right? But I can still understand, okay, like as a woman who's trying to work in a STEM-based field, right? What are some things that I've run into, um, or things like that, um, as well as self-efficiency and awareness. Like I think those are important, right? Um, but maybe there are some other characteristics that you think are important too. You can draw those in as like toppings, right? So like, oh, your pepperoni is, you need uh, to be organized, right? So draw some or organization pepperonis um, or, I don't know, what are some other toppings? Peppers, gar I love garlic. So you can add in some like uh, uh, good communication garlic, whatever it is that you want. Gosh, I, I Drew, we need to stop doing this when I, it's around lunchtime, so. You can uh, do that, but um, we'll, we will drop this in um, to the chat box for you shortly, and that way you can kind of design your own leadership pizza. And just kind of how Drew was talking about before, it, dep it may depend on, um, your pizza may depend on your situation, right? You may have a different pizza um, per, you know, where you're working. Um, you know, if you're coming in brand new uh, to a team, right, having that passion and purpose um, it's probably important, right? But maybe that team has just like had a, a really bad supervisor previously. And so they are really just not um, feeling motivated, right? So maybe you need to be a little more empathetic, right? To color that pizza in more um, and cast a little more vision and being a little more inspiring than just coming in full force with that passion. So, uh, but Hopefully this kind of helps you figure out what is your like ideal style or how do you operate best as a leader and, and what are you looking for in your supervisors as well. So we've been talking a lot about if you were in these positions, but also use this to analyze, you know, who you're currently working for and who you're um, interacting with. And then, okay, I need to stop sharing real quick, I think, and then I can put that in the chat box. Okay, there's everybody. I haven't seen you all in a while. Um, so.